All right, here we go. Adrian, how you doing, man? Doing awesome. How you doing, bud? Good. Adrian Keogh, CEO of Fulcrum Studio. Um, your family's good. I know we caught up a little bit before this call, but um, um, I'm looking forward to uh, talking to you today about um, the importance of websites, the importance of uh, a website design. Um, and, um, you know, it's 2020, and I think this decade is going to be a, a really a transformational year for, you know, all websites and how companies are looking at how to do how to scale and do commerce um, over this next decade. So can you kind of give maybe like a, like an overview of what you see coming so people can kind of, you know, start with the end in mind, like where, where, why, why do we need a website, not only a solid website for today, but for tomorrow? Well, to start, you know, COVID-19 changed a lot and it really forced people to think differently about their sales process where traditionally if you were, knocking on doors doing you know or had a re, you know a store retail environment it's changed people are going to be looking for you know to do commerce more and more continuously on the web and you know the more time that passes the more commerce will be done on web the more information will be shared via the web more descripting descriptions about products about services will be researched on the web and the more people will look at you and uh, through kind of a, the transparency, you know, lens of what the web has to say about any company, any person, you know, anything like that. So what the website has to do is it has to communicate. It has to be able to tell a story. It has to be able to give a good impression. It has to be able to help people to, you know, make a decision in favor of you versus opposed to you. And so the longer we go, five years, 10 years, the more and more relevant this is going to be year after year. Yeah. It's not going to change. Let's talk about that because I do think that a social presence, we're not necessarily talking about social presence right now, but, but everything, most everything on a social presence, a lot of time is anchored in the website. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about, I think this is really relevant, especially um, right now and moving forward, people are looking to make decisions. And people have a very difficult time making a decision. I would say that's one of the most difficult things people have as a business coach I see, making a decision. And so when you talk about the website being, you know, able to communicate, share and tell a story so people can make a decision, let's just dive into that a little bit, yep. right? So what are they looking for in a website to make a decision? They're, they're looking to see if, it makes them comfortable in order to take a next step. You know, within seconds, somebody's looking at it and making a decision, making an evaluation. Do I want to take further action? And so any kind of website has to first be able to, you know, express the fact that there's a right pairing. If you're looking for any product or service, first of all, is this the website that is going to match what you're looking for? Right. And then, you know, really what they're looking for is to get validation. You know, is this the product or service? Is this the type of person I want to call? Is this, a, is, if I'm going to buy something online, e-commerce, you know, am I comfortable? Is this a safe environment to make them purchase? You know, what's their customer service like? If I run into a problem, how is it going to be handled? You know, what kind of incentives are there? So in essence, what kind of experience are they going to have virtually versus, you know, one-on-one -on -one as if you and I are face-to-face -face shaking hands. Yeah. So yeah, the website has to deal with that type of interaction virtually. Yeah. I ordered um, a couple pairs of tennis shoes yesterday on Zappos. I mean, yep. you, know, you, you talk about the experience, the customer service, the ease of use, uh, you know, ordered, ordered two pairs of tennis shoes, um, if I need to return them, I can free of charge. They make it, they make everything incredibly easy. Um, the ordering, the checkout, I mean, ev everything about it is easy. Yep. So when, you know, to me, you know, we're always looking to build our relationship capital. We're always yep. looking in so many different ways, whether it's, you know, online, a website, at meetings, conferences, which have, those have changed as well because of COVID, et cetera. But we're building this relationship capital. So the website needs to continue building relationship capital like you're talking exactly. about. But so, and so I want to talk about the, the energy of a website, you know, how do you, 
how do you bring it alive, right? So I think that's the thing that a lot of times people um, get it wrong. They think they can do it themselves. Um, I'm a big believer that, you know, and, and, and you know this, I've shared this with you, but I, I had an internet company back when I graduated college in 1995 and we sold it in 1997. And, and, and many people thought it was, it was a fad. Right. And so and it's, it amazes me. And so now you can be more interactive. You can you can do so many things. But how do you create the energy so people feel like they're in a virtual, true virtual experience? Yeah, there's there's two main you know, components. Right. It's how a website is visually described and presented and how it's written. Um. If those two things are done at a very, very high level that really match the message that uh, the company is making, it makes, you know, or is presenting, it makes it that much easier in order to tell a story. But uh, a website really has to do, you know, a few different things. It really has to inform and it has to impress. Yeah. Right. If you can inform and you can impress, then you're helping that person to make a decision in your favor. If you do not inform and you make it complex, you make it difficult to find information, you make the information irrelevant or difficult to understand, then you're putting up barriers. Yeah. You're putting up barriers in the sales process, right? And so a website really has to be designed in order to reduce those barriers and help that person in a very fast moment of time make a positive decision for you. Yeah. So let, let's talk. I, I love I love um, the way you articulate everything. It's very tight and succinct. Uh, but let's talk about consistency because you know a, a website cannot be stale, uh, in my opinion. You know, and so how, talk about how consistently you need to be updating it, and with what type of content are we talking about? You know, video, blogs, like what consistent with what? You know, there's there's a lot of different you know philosophy out there. Uh, our philosophy really is about you update it with what is relevant versus quantity. Yeah, we'd want to make more impression with really good content, whether it's a blog or a video or new products or you know digital efforts or anything of that nature. But our philosophy is quality over quantity. Yeah. We want to make a maximum impression and we would like to train who our buyers are to be able to know when they get something from us, whether it's an email, whether it's a blog post, whether it's a new video, whatever the case, it's a webinar, you know, whatever it is, that is going to be quality. You know, yeah. And so we like to look at that as a quality over quantity type of uh, endeavor. And Oftentimes what we counsel our clients is, hey, if we can produce quality content twice a week, then that's what we're going to do. If we can produce quality content once a week, then that's what we're going to do. If we're going to only be able to do it less than that, then that's what we have to do. But every single touch point has to count. Yeah. Let's talk about your audience to respond positively. Yeah. No, I, I love that. But let's talk about, I think a lot of times people will do what you're suggesting. But then they may say, you know, Adrian, I, I, I'm not, I'm not feeling, I'm not seeing the results, right? I think everybody, uh, somewhere in their mind, at some percentage, has this idea that things will go viral, or you post something and new, and the and the phone's going to be mm -hmm. ringing off the hook, right? And yep. so I'm a big fan of um, delayed gratification, right? Uh -huh. You know, you you got to so things compound over time and you've yep. got to be the consistent player, exactly. not the do it for three to six months and be done player. So can you just kind of talk on, on the consistency of that? Mm -hmm. That's needed. Yeah. Well, we, when we use the word consistency, we, we tend to look at it and say, you have to be in business for the long term. Number one, you're, you're, we're doing everything that we can for short term goals and short-term gain, but you have to be in it for the long haul. Yeah. Because it's really a long-term play, right? But consistency, we look at it and say from a branding perspective, the message that's created on the website has to be filtered through the entire organization, right? Everything from when somebody has a first impression all the way through to how the salespeople behave and act, what type of communication goes into 
an email or a first response or you know anything else that is required a pitch deck a presentation anything it all has to be consistent and it has to be consistent year after year after year a lot of people will unfortunately uh, start off strong and then can you know loosen that type of uh, let's just say brand policing of the quality of their product over time and that's something that any business owner any executive needs to you know be aware of and maintain so that the integrity of the messaging and the integrity of the brand is just carries for year after year after year because it will gain traction you know, I want to talk about that comment year after year, year over year, year after year. Um, it is critical. You know, I, I think for a, a, the building of a website, no matter how small it starts, mm -hmm. you've got to be thinking, you know, three, four, five years down the line. Mm -hmm. the, way, the way I like to think about it is, you know, I'll, I'll use my podcast for an example, right? So I'm doing some live ones like I'm doing with you right now. My podcast used to be once a week, and then I moved it to twice a week, then I moved it to three times a week. And once COVID hit, I moved it to seven days a week. So mm -hmm. I built a lot of content over the year. And so it's seven days a week. So five years from now, I will have an additional almost 1,900 episodes. And so plus what I have now. So I'll have over 2,000 episodes. So my mm -hmm. point is, is I'm thinking in five years, I want 2,000 episodes. I'm not thinking for the next three months, I got to do X. Correct. And so in five years, from a, from a competitor standpoint, I believe I'd like competitors. There's enough business for everybody. But it's going to be hard to compete with someone like me as I continue to build my brand because I have over 2,000 interviews that I've done versus someone who stopped at 25. You're building a reputation. You're building the quality Correct. of your brand long term and Correct. using the internet to do so. Right. And I'm just using five years. I, I actually think 10 years, 15, 20 years down the line as well. But you got to think about what you want then. And so you and yes. so. Right. So I just I just think that's really, really important what you say. It's year over year. It's not it month is. over month. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Talk about this, Adrian, because I think sometimes creating uh, content is can be difficult to evolve your website. And so, um, you know, one of the things I do is I, I bulk my stuff. And I know a lot of people bulk their stuff as well. So um, talk about how to do it or the resources to use to help create it. Because that's, that's in a, a job in its own in many ways. It is. And usually what ends up happening is if any company decides that they work, they're going to you know, hire an agency to support them, they need to have the subject matter experts in-house, right? The people that understand what their customers are asking for understand what problems they're solving, understand you know, what's coming in the market. And then in our particular case, they feed us that information. Right. And then we're able to create stories or we're able to create blog posts or we're able to create you know, uh, PR or anything that ends up supporting the website, right? Because the more that we can drive the traffic to them, the more relevant they become. And when you think about how you know, Google works, right? It's looking for relevancy, right? Right, And so being able to organize what customers are thinking, what customers are wanting, what customers are saying, what the market trends are, you know, and then, you know, be able to produce content. You could do it in batches, absolutely. Um, but you do it with a little bit of education. You do a little bit of entertaining. You kind of try to mix a little bit of those flavors together to help to drive traffic and help to inform, you know, customers of new things that are happening. Yeah. And that helps to, that's what helps to keep you relevant yeah, in, in, in the web world, new content, important content. Yeah. Uh, well said. Uh, well said. Let me ask you a question. You know, you're talking about Google. I think everybody's trying to figure out how Google works. It seems they change, they seem to change their algorithms, you know, daily, weekly, et cetera. How, how does, you know, can you dive into a little bit about, you know, how the SEO element of everything works and how people should be utilizing and thinking about that to drive traffic to their site if this is, if that's something that they want to do? Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of like a chess game, right? You're just playing chess against Google and you're playing chess against your competitors, yeah. right? So you have to, if you're going to go into that world, you have to understand you're playing a chess match. 
And that chess match is somebody who's going to play against you constantly. And so you have to be ready for that. And so a website really has to be designed with two audiences. It has to be designed with the Google bots in mind so that they can read the website, read it clearly, read it efficiently, right? And it has to be built for that. And it has to be built for you to read it, humans, people to read it, right? Both those things have to be accomplished in order to win you know, the website uh, or online game. And what Google's doing is Google is always trying to uh, change their algorithm for what they consider making a better user experience for you and I. So everything that they're doing is just simply trying to say, hey, is will this change make the user experience better? Will they be able to find information better? Will it be more in line? Will, will the matchmaking happen? Because it's like a dating matchmaking game, right? That's what Google's yeah. doing. You're putting in a search and you're saying, hey, I want this. And they're searching the web and saying, this company has this, this web page has it, this blog has this, this video describes that. And so keeping up with the most relevant content, putting the most relevant content out there for what people are searching for, which is a part of the research side of SEO, is understanding that. And then being able to produce the content that matches that as long as it's aligned with your business yeah, and isn't something that's wildly different. Well said, well said. Adrian, um, with COVID, you mentioned this at the beginning, COVID you know, changed mm -hmm. things and, and we're all seeing that in, in, in every element of business and life right now. Um, how, how is this, especially once we move past COVID, how will this affect the next decade um, when it comes to commerce and websites? You know, I, I've had two conversations recently. Um, both of the companies have retail stores um, and both of them are now preparing to bring all of their services online. One of them, uh, both of them are in the fitness space, but one of them provided, um, you know, studio type of services with coaches and instructors and that kind of thing. And the other is uh, equipment. And, both of them now understand that, you know, this thing has put a scare into people and we don't really know what tomorrow holds for it. Exactly. Yeah. We got a lot of predictions, but one thing that we do know is that people are home today and people are shopping today and people will continue to do so. The trends have, have not stopped. They've just moved upwards. Right. And so companies are starting to think that way of saying they have to, if they decide that they're going to keep a you know a brick and mortar business, they have to now adapt or pivot into a hybrid business. That's going to be part online, part you know brick and mortar, or shift it all online. Yeah. And so it had this is the time for strategic initiatives and thought to be made on which way will a company go, knowing that the e-commerce side of business will never stop. It's just going to grow. Yeah. You know, it's hard to believe that some of the companies that are moving to more of an e-commerce and moving to, you know, curbside this and curbside that, you know, it's, I don't think that's going away. And it's hard to believe that it took them, it took this for them to conform to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think, um, I think I agree with you. I think we're going to see more and more because everybody needs the, the backup plan in place versus scrambling to, to make it happen. Yeah, what we found is a lot of emergency response, like how, oh, this happened, now how do we adapt really quickly? Where I think more strategic initiatives are gonna be put forward for the future that says we have to always take into account a minimum, a hybrid model. Right, yeah, because now we all have it in our heads also that a pandemic is a, is a real thing. It's a real thing. Right? And, and it's about being proactive and, and carving out time. I, I see when I'm, when I'm working with clients as far as thinking in a truly now thinking innovative, not, you know, a piece of software or this, then the other, but truly innovative in reinventing yourself, your company and, and so many elements they're, they're, companies can't afford to be reactive in that, in that innovative space any longer. And the way the internet works, the early adopters, when they do it right, gain. Yeah. And they gain traction big time. Yeah. No, I agree. And so, it's, it's, it's this, the internet game is not for the faint of heart and it's not for slow 
it, it favors the fast and the aggressive. I was uh, talking to somebody the other day and was recommending, did you ever read the book Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore? No, but I will. It's a great book. It talks about early adopters and laggards and, you know, and, and, and just, you know, how, how, how business works in this setting. I think it's really, it's, it's, I mean, I read it 20 some years ago, but it's a really, especially with what's going on right now. Um, so my last question to you is about, um, not my last, but my last question before I ask you just a quick question is adaptability. You know, mm -hmm. there's been all these studies that over, you know, by the year 2030, 85% of the jobs that exist um, do not exist today um, mm -hmm. in 2030. Um, and, and that colleges before COVID were going to be teaching adaptability, you know, with an emphasis on adaptability because the kids of today have to learn how to adapt. Well, I think kids of today are learning how to adapt in a way that school probably couldn't have taught them. Mm -hmm. And so how can a company who has a presence right now that is relatively stale, let's just say it's even, you know, up to, up to standards of maybe 2017, 2018, mm -hmm. what can a company do today, step one, to adapt to evolve their website strategy and design? I think the job one is they have to really consider number one that it's a part of the future of business and it will never go away. It's going to become more and more and more and more important. Yeah. Uh, to the point where even company resources are going to be almost fully online. Um, they also have to look at who their next buyers are in the next. Who are the buyers in the next five years? You know, if it is a younger crowd or even somebody of my age, guess what? We're gonna be online. Yeah. You know, and it just, it has to become a part of the strategic initiative of any company at this point. Yeah. And there's no getting around it and there's no way to do it cheap. You have, if a company really wants to compete, they have to do it right. Correct. They can't try to do it economically. They have to make a strategic decision and investment to make it right. Yeah. Because yeah. the future of buyers are gonna be, like you're saying, they're gonna be growing up with this. Right, well, and I agree with you. I think sometimes companies look at investments uh, into themselves and their companies as an expense, when really it's an investment for the long term. As you're talking, I'm thinking almost like the website really is another C-level exec, and it may not be able to speak physically, but it can speak in numbers um, and, and, and things of that nature. And it almost really needs to be on that line because it's, it's just a communication more, tool. It's a community. It's a right. Probably the and most. It's a very powerful. serious one. Yeah. Um, Adrian, um, who, who's your ideal client? And in case somebody wants to connect with you. Uh, ideal clients are not, you know, industry specific. They're really about, you know, either a business owner or an executive group who thinks like what we talked about, who values, you know, the quality, who values, the investment and values uh, a collaborative relationship to do the best job possible. Yeah. You know, to position the company in a way that enhances them, makes their job easier, reduces sales cycles, yeah. you know, things like that. If you got business owners and executive teams that value that, those are the people we like to work with. Yeah. Tell people your website or your phone number or whatever you want to give them. Um, website is uh, www.fulcrum, F-U-L-K-R-U-M, dot studio. There is no dot com. That's fulcrum dot studio. And website, or sorry, telephone number is 248-854-1011. That's great. All right, last couple questions, Adrian. Um, what are you doing for fun during COVID? <laughs> you know what? I... I I burned wood when it was hot. I go cycling and I just have spent a lot of time with family. I just yeah. enjoyed the time with my kids. I've got three teenage daughters. Yeah, I have two teenagers and, and spending time with them. My wife, it's been, it's been great. And um, I find myself reading a lot. Yeah. Every day. Yeah, I know. I'm reading and just, I, I, it's, 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 it, there's more space to kind of just, you know, unplug and do stuff like that, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, what's your favorite book? Speaking of reading, favorite book that you would recommend right now? 
I'm reading Boundaries for Leaders, Dr. Henry Cloud. Okay. And I read my Bible. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good. That's a that's a crowd favorite on this show, on this show when I ask you. Um, and then lastly, one piece of advice you'd give somebody right now as they're as you know as of May fourth, two thousand twenty, you know how to get through what we're getting through. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. Yeah. Well said. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. Go for it. All right. Good. I love that advice, Adrian. Always a pleasure connecting with you. I appreciate your wisdom and sharing it today on the show. Um, and, uh, if you have any questions, anybody reach out to Adrian and, uh, we'll chat. I know we awesome. will uh, connect soon. So thank you very much. And, uh, I appreciate you taking time. Stay safe, uh, and enjoy, uh, enjoy your family. Awesome. Thank you guys. Right. Thanks, Take care. Okay.